This presentation content has been created by Eclipse Security LLC for Microsoft Corporation. For any questions or comments, please email inquiries at eclipsesecuritylc.com. The Secure Design Principles Level 100 presentation introduces the role that the Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle fulfills in trusted application design and provides an overview of secure design principles employed within the SDL, including attack surface reduction, basic privacy, threat modeling, defense in depth, least privilege, and secure defaults. Addressing this subject matter will enable our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. Note that this is a level 100 presentation meant to familiarize you with the security design fundamentals and principles. These fundamentals and principles will be built upon in later SDL presentations. In this presentation, we will complete a high-level overview of the SDL and the important role it fulfills in the design stage of an application software development lifecycle. We will also review the secure design principles employed within the SDL that has helped Microsoft better deliver safer and more trusted applications to its customers since the inception of the SDL in 2004. The Microsoft SDL is a holistic and comprehensive approach that leverages education, process, technology, and executive commitment to consistently create more secure software internally within and external of Microsoft. Since 2004, all internal Microsoft developers have been required to adhere to the SDL, and Microsoft has updated the SDL every six months to address any emerging threats since its inception. True to its name, the SDL was created to complement rather than disrupt the software development lifecycle. The core phases and principles of the SDL include the training phase, the requirements phase, the design phase, the implementation phase, the verification phase, the release phase, and finally the response phase. In the training phase, every Microsoft developer must complete mandatory security training focusing on secure application development practices. Training sessions include topics such as threat modeling, secure development and testing practices, and security for application development managers. In the requirement phase, requirements for security and privacy must accompany functional requirements of the software that's being created. Such requirements may include the use of encryption, authentication, and other security measures based on the business requirements exposure, and sensitive data. To that end, a security and privacy risk analysis is performed at this stage. In addition, the threshold for security and privacy, or bug bar, is defined during this phase to ensure that bugs with certain severity are addressed and resolved before the software is officially released. For the design phase, eradicating coding bugs with security implications is not sufficient. Design vulnerabilities can have a substantial detrimental impact on security and are much more difficult to address during the verification phase. To that end, threat modeling is a critical SDL requirement and a Microsoft security innovation that is recognized by analysts as the next evolution in creating more secure software. Through threat modeling, architects and developers at Microsoft are able to approach security in a structured and methodical way from an attacker's perspective. This allows Microsoft to identify and reduce attack surface and mitigate the risk of potential security design issues. The implementation phase is the application code development phase where code is written by developers using industry best practices and analyzed with both internal and external tools such as static code analyzers and special security debuggers to help ensure that those best practices are being followed. Requirements are also specified by the SDL in this phase to ensure that applications are built using the latest compiler versions and built-in compiler protection features. The verification phase is the quality assurance phase within which rigorous security testing is conducted in addition to typical functional testing procedures. In the release phase, the final security review is the major milestone that a Microsoft product team must pass in order to release a product under the SDL. During this meeting, security experts and the development team review all of the activities 
mitigations, and security artifacts that are relevant to the project in order to ensure that the security quality requirements are satisfied. During this phase, the product team defines a response plan describing procedures, accountabilities, and contact information in case security vulnerabilities are discovered after the product is optional, operational and used by the customers. In the response phase, after an application is released, the Microsoft Security Response Center, or MSRC, handles any security issues that are uncovered in the weld and mobilizes product teams within Microsoft to provide timely fixes for security issues. In summary, secure software development requires executive commitment, ongoing process improvement, education and training from VPs to product managers to developers to testers, tools to aid in detecting security vulnerabilities, and incentives and consequences to ensure everyone adheres to the SDL process. As was previously indicated, this presentation focuses on the secure design principles of the SDL. After the requirements for a solution has been identified in the early stages of an application software development lifecycle, the next step is to design and architect a solution that satisfies those identified requirements. Developing trusted applications requires that sound security and privacy decisions be made early in the design phase because decisions made at this stage will highly influence subsequent efforts in the later stages of the software development lifecycle and the final state of the application. Microsoft has found that by adopting this approach, application development costs, such as those required to address and resolve security and privacy issues, are significantly reduced compared to if security and privacy were considered later in the SDLC or not at all. This is because applications developed against more secure and privacy-aware designs tend to be exposed to fewer threats and contain less vulnerabilities. Microsoft has helped ensure that security and privacy considerations are incorporated into its application design efforts through the SDL by applying the following secure design principles. In the remainder of this presentation, we will briefly review each of these prin principles and mention how they can be applied to better ensure that application design consists of sufficient and effective security and privacy best practices. Lastly, the insights gleaned by Microsoft, which are incorporated in its SDL, and more specifically, in this presentation focusing on secure design principles, are being shared with each of you as a way for our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. The attack surface of an application is the portion of the program code and functionality that is exposed to a particular person or another program. For example, an open network port and a user interface are examples of an application's attack surface. One of the most effective secure design principles that can be used to protect an application from malicious acts is attack surface reduction, or ASR. The principle of attack surface reduction is to minimize the attack surface while still satisfying the functional requirements of the application. Secure coding will reduce but not eliminate all vulnerabilities in your application. However, by reducing the attack surface, you minimize the number of vulnerabilities that the attacker can discover and attempt to exploit. Here's an example of attack surface. Let's pretend we're a home security company and we want to protect this home from a burglar breaking into the home and stealing the valuables inside. What is our attack surface? At the front of the house, we have several windows and doors that a burglar could use or exploit. At the side of the house, we also have a couple windows that a burglar could use or exploit. And then finally, don't forget the chimney. Like this house, our applications have various points that are exposed to people or to other programs and computers. Each one of these can be exploited by a malicious user, and with attack surface reduction, our goal is to minimize the number of potential vulnerabilities a malicious user could exploit. In order to reduce the attack surface of an application, application designers need to first know how to measure the attack surface. The attack surface is defined by the set of interfaces or entry points to the program. Attack surface analysis, or ASA, is the process of identifying and understanding all of the entry points that comprise the attack surface, and is successfully performed by enumerating all of the interfaces 
protocols, and code execution paths. Another important element of ASA is understanding the trust levels required to access each entry point. For each entry point, you must consider the importance of the feature that it enables. For features that are not important to a vast majority of users, turn the feature off, disable it by default, or do not even install it by default. Force the users that really want or need the feature to take explicit action to attain that feature. This way, any vulnerability related to that specific feature will affect a very small percentage of the product's user base. Next, consider which specific classes of users require that feature, and then restrict its use to those classes. For example, do not default to making the feature remotely accessible. Do not default to allowing anonymous access. Do not default to running with more privileges than is needed, and so on. A significant aspect of ASR is restricting who has access to a particular product feature and how such users may attain and use that access. Attack surface analysis is an iterative process. For each feature that you analyze, you must also analyze all of its sub-features. And again, you want to restrict access to features as much as possible. For example, if your application in general processes files, configure it to read only the most common file types that it accepts. Force the user to explicitly configure it to process the less commonly used file types. Also, ensure that when the program writes files that it sets the proper ownership and writes to the file. Do not create executable files unless those files must be executable. Disable older, faulty, and less used protocols such as SSL version 2 and PCT. Force users to use more robust alternatives such as SSL version 3 and TLS or force them to explicitly configure applications to accept those older protocols. If your application provides a service or implements a protocol, restrict the commands that it accepts by default to those that are most commonly needed and used. Force the administrator to explicitly configure other commands if they want to accept them. While attack surface reduction focuses on restricting access, it is not strictly about disabling or not installing features. For instance, instead of using UDP as a network protocol, use TCP, which can be more easily secured. Or instead of making a network service internet accessible, make it local network accessible only until unless needed. You can also use attack surface reduction to enforce the principle of least privilege, which will be discussed later, by designing the program to run with the lowest set of privileges required to perform its function. Here are some examples of how attack surface reduction has been applied in the latest versions of Microsoft products that have previously encountered security complications. Authentication before interaction achieves attack surface reduction by disallowing anonymous access by default. Firewall on by default closes all but specifically required ports. Many services are now off by default and when turned on are running as low privileged network services. When services are necessary out of the box, they are restricted to local host access. And functions or features that have been proven to introduce unnecessary and undesirable risk in the past are also now turned off by default. In addition to the SAL design principle of attack surface reduction, another core principle that needs to be considered when developing trusted software is that of privacy. Privacy, like security, is another key factor when developing trusted applications. However, they are not the same. Privacy focuses on the control and choices users have regarding the use, collection, and distribution of their personal information. Security, on the other hand, is applied to protect assets, including personal information, from threats. Again, when designing trusted applications, both privacy and security together need to be evaluated. The SCL helps application designers create more privacy-aware applications by establishing during the design phase privacy best practices, standards, and guidelines. A common myth regarding the relationship between security and privacy is that if a system is sufficiently secure, then privacy is also preserved. However, this may not always be the case. A security breach can certainly result in a loss of privacy. For instance, Credit card information may be accessed by unauthorized users, but it is also possible for a secure system to cause a loss of privacy without a breach. Consider the secure but privacy violating scenario. Securely storing personal information 
and then sending that information using a securely encrypted communication channel to third parties without properly notifying and receiving consent from the user may be securely implemented but obviously does not take into the consideration the rights of the user. Some rights may have legal implications. In this scenario, the user's privacy is When developing privacy-aware applications, three primary objectives must be satisfied. The first objective is fulfilling legal obligations. Depending on how an application behaves, certain controls and documentation must be established in order to fulfill legal obligations. For instance, if an application involves users that are children, then it must be compliant with the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Or, if an application transfers any personally identifiable information, regardless of sensitive or non-sensitive, then certain legal obligations arise. The second objective is increasing customer trust. Building great software is not enough. You need to earn and increase your customer's trust in your software. By focusing on privacy considerations, you can earn required trust by designing more trusted applications that increase transparency in the user's experience and will empower the user to control their personal data through guidance that is easy to understand and actionable. In a later The primary privacy objectives associated with developing trusted applications were presented in previous slide. As previously explained, certain behaviors of an application could create legal obligations that need to be met and how those behaviors could also block the deployment of an application. The table on this slide shows some of the common application behaviors and legal obligations and block deployment scenarios that could arise because of those behaviors. For example, if an application is designed for users under 13 years of age, then legal obligations such as those described in the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act must be met. As another example, if an application transfers personal information, then satisfying legal obligations from the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act and the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act could be required. Application designers need to understand the behavior of the applications and corresponding privacy concerns implied by those behaviors. Microsoft has developed the Microsoft Privacy Guidelines for developing products and services to help application development teams better understand privacy implications associated with application behavior. In order to help application development teams better develop privacy compliant products and services, Microsoft has released the Microsoft Privacy Guidelines for developing products and services. This document provides common definitions and rules for developing better privacy compliant products and services. The document is divided into two sections. The first section contains definitions and key concepts including data types, notice, consent, and so on. The second section contains rules categorized by specific development scenarios such as collection and transfer of personally identifiable information, storage of data on customer systems, and onward transfer of, of personally identifiable information to third parties. There are also specific scenarios for products or services that collect age or are attractive to children and for products that are deployed in enterprises. 
Products deployed in enterprises are a special case. Because developers' obligations transitions from the user to the enterprise administrator, you need to enable the enterprise administrator to fulfill their company privacy policies. At Microsoft, our goal is that our customers will be empowered to control the collection, use, and distribution of their personal In this section of the presentation, the process called threat modeling, which Microsoft uses through the SDL process to understand and address any and all threats to an application, will be briefly explained. It is important not to confuse threats with vulnerabilities. A threat is simply what an adversary might try to do to compromise a protected resource in the system. A vulnerability is a specific way that a threat is exploitable based on an unmitigated attack path. A person in an application design group with security expertise typically leads the threat modeling activities, which begin with identification of all potential threats to the system and assets accessed by the system. Threat models must be revisited periodically to account for new threats resulting from new and evolving attack techniques. Please recall that this portion of the presentation is meant only to provide you with a brief introduction to the threat modeling process. At a high level, threat modeling consists of a number of activities conducted during the design phase of the application development process. These activities begin by envisioning the application as it will be used by typical users in a typical environment, and continue by identifying all of the potential threats to the application and to assets accessed via the application. During this process, all security-related assumptions and external dependencies are documented, as are external security notes which are notes to help users and administrators understand the security boundaries of the application being developed. The threat modeling process continues by creating a number of data flow diagrams, which model the trust boundaries of applications and its components and the flow of data between the application and its environment, as well as the flow of data between components within the application. The next step in the threat modeling process is to determine the types of threats facing the application from the malicious user's perspective and list all of the data flow diagram elements. The data flow diagram elements represent the application assets that need to be protected from attack. Knowing what needs to be protected and how they will be attacked enables you to choose appropriate mitigations for each threat. Note that we're still in the design phase of the application development. We are now designing security controls into the product based upon the most likely threats, which is the most cost-effective juncture to address such considerations. At this point, we need to review the threat model, the data flow diagram elements that need protection, and the mitigation or defense and countermeasures to ensure that mitigations do indeed protect the assets from the threats. If anything is found amiss, this is the time to start from the beginning of the threat modeling process once again. To help users with threat modeling, Microsoft has published the threat modeling tool it uses internally to help automate aspects of the threat modeling process. This tool is available for download from MSDN at the link shown here. In addition to attack surface reduction, privacy and threat modeling, another key design principle that should be leveraged to create trusted applications is the principle of defense in depth. A key perspective of defense in depth is beginning the application design process with the mindset that all applications and hardware will ultimately fail. If you go back to the burglar breaking into the house scenario, all the doors and windows to the house could be locked to keep the burglar out. Those might fail, so an alarm system could be used and installed. The alarm system also might fail, so the valuables inside the house could be placed inside a safe and so on. In the context of designing and developing trusted applications, this means that privacy and security features or mechanisms defending our applications will inevitably fail. Unfortunately, most applications today are designed and implemented in such a way 
that the application can be compromised when a single and often only layer of defense fails or is breached. With the defense in depth principle, applications are built in such a way that if one defense layer fails, there are additional layers of defense that can provide protection to the application. Think about it this way. If, an app, if a malicious user is going to compromise our application, then we should make their job as difficult as possible by Im implementing multiple layers of defense that they need to breach versus just one. That's defense in depth. The easiest way application designers can get started with this powerful principle is to evaluate their application designs and ask themselves, if one layer of defense is breached, what other layers can provide additional protection to the application and to the assets that it is protecting? Here's an example of defense in depth and how this principle can be leveraged to make tr trusted applications more difficult to compromise. Consider a malicious user who wants to gain access to sensitive data stored on a server, such as credit card numbers or personally identifiable information. Again, most applications today are designed and developed with a single layer of defense in mind, typically a firewall. If a malicious user is able to breach the singular layer of defense, then that user is able to compromise the application. On the other hand, an application designed with a defense in depth principle has multiple layers of defense protecting it. For instance, defense layers like input validation, smart card access, and IP security are examples of additional layers of defense that could protect an application. So now, even if one layer of defense fails, there are additional layers of defense that could provide protection to the application and the attack is halted. In our example, both the firewall and the second defense layer failed. The third and fourth layers of de defense were still able to halt the attack, thereby protecting the sensitive data. The previous SDL secure design principle of defense in depth started with a notion that all software and hardware would fail at some point. With the least privilege principle, we assume that all applications will be compromised. However, through employing the principle of least privilege, should a malicious user compromise an application, the amount of damage that may be inflicted is limited. Pretend that we have a malicious user and an application running on a system that the user is hoping to compromise. In this example, the application is running as an administrative or local system state. That is, the application has the same rights as any administrator on the system. When our malicious user here compromises the application, because that application is running in an administrative state, the malicious user can now use the application to perform malicious actions such as changing system passwords, reading user files, and accessing any data on that system. In fact, because the malicious user is essentially an administrator on that system through the compromised application, the user can do whatever is desired. Now, see what happens when a malicious user compromises the same application, but this time the application is running using the least privileged principle. That is, it is running in a lower privileged state, such as a network service. Now, when the malicious user compromises the application, the malicious user cannot perform malicious actions such as changing system passwords, reading, reading user files, and so on, because the application that the malicious user is using to perform those nefarious actions does not have the privileges to do so. In applying the least privilege principle, we have greatly limited the potential damage a malicious user can apply to a compromised system. It is still not an ideal situation. We would rather the malicious user not be able to compromise the application at all. But if the malicious user does compromise the application, then at least we can limit the amount of damage that may be inflicted. Here are a few tips when using least privilege to design applications that are to be more resilient to malicious attack. Think minimally. Ask yourself, what is the minimum access your application needs to function correctly? If your application requires higher privileges, elevate those privileges only when required and release those privileges immediately after the purposes of those privileges have been satisfied. 
In the previous section, an overview of the principle of least privilege was provided. In this section, another important and last principle known as secure defaults will be presented. Recall that with a tax service reduction principle, any non-critical part of an application that is exposed to a human or system was removed or disabled by default to reduce the number of exposed vulnerabilities a malicious user could use to compromise an application. The secure defaults principle considers the situation where part of an application needs to be exposed to a human or system by default and how this may be conducted more safely and securely. Microsoft, through the SDL process, has used this principle to better ensure that customers have safer experiences with our applications out of the box, rather than after extensive and often manual configuration activities that must be performed. With this principle, it is left to the user to reduce the security and privacy of an application and not left to Microsoft, the manufacturer of the software. Malicious users commonly scan networks for applications or devices that are known to be insecure by default, such as wireless routers and some web servers. These applications are easy to compromise. With secure defaults, this ability is taken away from the malicious user and helps keep your customers safer. Regarding the secure defaults principle, designers need to evaluate the various parts of their application from the perspective of what is the most secure or privacy aware manner in which this part may be configured. Here are some examples. For firewalls, Microsoft Windows can be configured with the firewall on or off. By default, the latest and future versions of, micro of Windows come with the firewall turned on by default. SSL socket. If your application can read data through an SSL socket, then by default it should be configured to use only the latest secure protocol versions such as version 3. TLS and so on, and avoid insecure versions such as version 2. For use, user access over anonymous or authenticated ch channels. If your application has the option of allowing users to access it over anonymous or authenticated channels, then by default it should be authenticated. For password complexity. If your application can require users to have complex passwords, then that feature should be enabled by default. Then finally, for storing user passwords as hashes. If your application can store user passwords as hashes or clear text, then it should store passwords as hashes by default. This concludes the discussion on the SDL Secure Design Principles. In this presentation, we completed a high-level overview of the SDL and the important role it fulfills in the design stage of an application's software development lifecycle. We noted that when security and privacy considerations are sufficiently and effectively incorporated early into an application's development lifecycle, such as in the design phase, the overall number of threats an application is exposed to and the number of vulnerabilities an application may contain will be substantially reduced. Additionally, their overall cost of maintaining trusted applications will be reduced due to the number of remediation efforts required to address post-deployment security and privacy issues will most likely be reduced. Finally, we explored the core secure design principles leveraged by the Microsoft SDL. They were attack service reduction, basic privacy, threat modeling, defense in depth, least privilege, and finally, secure defaults. Lastly, the insights gleaned by Microsoft, which are incorporated in its SDL, and more specifically in this presentation, which focused on secure design principles, have been shared with each of you as a way for our organization to enhance our application development practices and the security of our applications. This presentation content has been created by Eclipse Security LLC for Microsoft Corporation. For any questions or comments, please email inquiries at eclipsesecurityllc.com.